explain it like I'm five of sim swapping here. You'll, you'll be the judge if that works. <clears throat> so you may have seen, if you're logged into a website, right, that the website asks you for a phone number, and if you ever want to do something, like for example, resetting your password, or you, know, you log in for the first time from a new computer, it'll ask you to verify that it's really you by sending you an SMS with a code to your, to your phone. Right, and there, maybe instead they use a phone call that they, that they send to your phone, but they'll do something basically with your phone to verify that you actually own that phone number that you initially specified. And you can argue that it's definitely better than nothing, right? I mean, just using a password and trusting it from wherever it is means I can just guess it, and there's an additional step here that makes it a little bit more secure. Now, the problem with this is that if I can steal your phone, then obviously I can you know, now reset your password, right? Because uh, I steal your phone, I trigger the SMS, I read the SMS on your phone, and I can now uh, change the password from you on that particular website. Now it turns out, you don't actually have to steal the phone, you can do it much easier. If I can manage to get a SIM card for your account, then I can basically do the same thing with any phone, right? Because now my phone becomes, becomes tied to your account, so all the SMS that previously went to you now go to me. And uh, the, the simple idea of a SIM swap is to do exactly that. So all I need to do is, you know, let's say you're with AT&T, need to find one AT&T employee or a retail chain that's affiliated with AT&T that sells AT&T phones that has the authority to order a new SIM card or issue a new SIM card. And if I can find one person who's willing to do this for me, um, then I can take over your account, right? And I can do this by tricking that person, maybe I can uh, you know, bring in a, a fake social security number, maybe I can whine and beg and tell a story about my dead grandma or something like that, right? Um, maybe I can just uh, you know, pay somebody off, maybe I just actually have an employee that's in there and that does this wholesale with a bunch of them, or maybe I hack into one of these terminals and, and do that remotely. But basically what we're doing is we're reducing the security of your online account to the security of a large telephone carrier you know, and the, the ability of anyone to, to basically obtain a SIM card in your name. Right. That makes sense. And and after you've done that, what kind of car can you buy? <laughs> yeah. So uh, there was a there was a recent story. There was this 19-year-old kid in Santa Clara that did exactly that. You know, not very sophisticated. Just a little bit of social engineering. Um, uh, basically, uh, you know, sim swapped a couple of folks in the the Bitcoin industry. Uh, cleared all the Bitcoin accounts, sold that, and bought himself a McLaren Honda. As uh, a McLaren uh, sports car, and I think uh, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Something like that, yeah. <laughs> he was very, trying to remain inconspicuous. Very low profile, really. I don't know how they got him. <laughs> they could, you know, a helicopter trip to Coachella or something like that. So it's, it's, uh, you know, but it's, we're seeing that basically people that have very little technical background are doing this. And then we're seeing sort of uh, well-organized groups doing this at scale, uh, you know, with a lot of technical sophistication. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, and and to add or? Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah, one thing I'd also say to think about here is I feel the way this played out is we thought it was a good idea to give tens of thousands of people the ability to port you know, around our phone numbers because there was a history of locking with carriers. And so our response to that was saying, okay, well, I don't be locked into my carrier. I want to be able to move carriers whenever I want in case they spike up my rates. So we you know, lobbied for making it really easy to port phone numbers, and that played out as expected. Um, but now we have all of these different people, all these different uh, retail chains who can port your number. And so we built a security model that expects all of them to be honest. And uh, any, any security model that expects thousands of people to all be honest is flawed. Um, and uh, so a bunch of articles actually came out this morning from the Department of Justice uh, showing that there was this, uh, with AT&T, there was a large bribing ring uh, actually bribing a lot of AT&T employees to install malware on their networks. And the first one may say no, the second one may say no. You see one of them to say yes, and then everybody's phones are vulnerable. And, and this isn't just a crypto thing, right? I mean, there are other populations, other profiles that would, uh, you know, this isn't just a, a hack that uh, will be able to drain a crypto account. Yeah, I actually talked to my bank and said, uh, hey, is there anything other than my phone number at the end of the day that uh, is required, my phone number, social security number, that's required to drain my account? And uh, they made excuse here, excuse there, but as I keep repeating the question, they finally had to say, well, yeah, that's what it comes <laughs> down to. Um, it's just not a great answer. Right. And, and Michael, you've had uh, a lot of experience with the carriers. What, what, what's the situation with the carriers now? I mean, this is a, this is a problem that's not new, it's at least years old. Yeah, it's at least five or six years old. It's been accelerating, and they are burying their heads in the sand. 
um, they are just doubling down on denial. And um, you know, their response to uh, my lawsuit when I got hacked, well, I got hacked the first time uh, after employing quite a bit of security. Uh, I've been in the industry since 2013, so you know, I've got treasures, I got ledgers, all of my uh, accounts that are that are you know uh, custodial accounts have Google 2 of A. I don't keep very much in them. I keep them mainly in offline storage. But you know, I'm 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 in the industry. I'm an advisor to a number of companies and. We've done PR Transform Group and advisory services for over 150 companies. And um, you know, there's some tokens that you have to keep in staking wallets, and then you have to just simply pass or protect them. And there are ways that very sophisticated uh, hackers can go and get to those files through different hacks of completely non-crypto software. Hmm. And they wouldn't get access to even start you know, monkeying around and try to figure out how to hack into the cloud or hack into, uh, you know, a shrink wrap software that might be able to go and find a fragment of what you've created, uh, you know, because I've got all the anti-malware, I've got all the anti-key logging and all that, um, unless they were able to get access to my digital life. Mm. And the first time that I got hacked, only lost half a Bitcoin, but they then took over my Skype and conned other people out of 13 Bitcoin. Mm. They almost got caught because they tried to go to a contact of mine of a client because we were representing Zcoin at the time, and they thought that they wanted to turn all their Bitcoin into Zcoin because it was more anonymous. And the guy emailed me and said, "Hey, I think somebody's trying to, um, you know, uh, impersonate you." And I didn't see that email because I was up all night trying to change accounts, and and he didn't. He just replied to something, so it wasn't a new email. If I had seen it, I would have said. Tell them you can do it, and then say, I'm now sending the money to the real Michael Turpin. Right. right. But uh, that didn't happen, so I did end up losing half a Bitcoin, and uh, people that I know lost, lost 13 and a half, and I had to go on other social media until Microsoft was able to give me back my Skype. I then went to Microsoft and said, I want to separate all of my, uh, my Skype, my, my LinkedIn, all this, and they said, no, for your convenience, we won't let you separate. And I said, for my security, I'd like you to, because Microsoft, and this is not unique to software, um, they feel that Google's competitors, so they will not let you put Google 2FA on any Microsoft software. They have something called Microsoft Authenticator, which doesn't work. It works for maybe a week or two, and then it uninstalls itself or gets a bug and it doesn't work. Just Google to see how many times it doesn't work. And so there's a number of vulnerabilities like this, which is why the solution, I shouldn't say solutions yet, or I mean, my, in my opinion, the solution, first and foremost, is you have to cover the password. Yeah. Those, those thousands of people that you have to trust, make a law, FCC probably is the one to do it, that basically says, among other things, you know, you can't see these, these passwords. You have to have a pass fail like a bank. You can't go into your bank and tell the teller, hey, I forgot my pen, can you look it up? Right, right. And same thing with most passwords, they're pass fail. You put it in, into your keypad, uh, airlines, hotel chains, and it's pass fail. If not, you say, oh, if you forgot your password, you better call the fraud department. Right, right. And that's not the case because exactly what you said, because they wanted to make it easier to port so they could stall when you're trying to change things. But, you know, I, I think that having you remember your password is not much of a uh, extra factor. And that would literally shut this thing down immediately. And they know that, and they're being unconscionable in not, uh, in, in not you know, implementing it. Well, so uh, that's kind of where are we at the moment. Anybody have a question about uh, the current state of affairs? Any? So what happens when there are two SIM cards that belong to one person and they're in the field, right? Because somebody issues a SIM card, but you still have your SIM card. So now there are two SIM cards with your phone number. No, it moves from one to the other. Okay. Usually okay. the, the old one gets switched off. Okay, so the other one's off. So I mean, if you yeah. just suddenly lose cell reception or even data connectivity if it happens first, Right. on your phone, yeah. that sign. <laughs> and, and everybody in here, since you're on the list of people who go to crypto-related conferences and talks, keep an eye on your phone during the call, just in case you know anybody drops off the network, we'll know. Uh, so I'm Google Fi, specifically because it's a seamless phone. Uh, How come everyone in crypto does not have a seamless phone? Uh, so uh, seamless still need, uh, has to meet requirements of being able to port a phone number. So uh, it, you're not actually physically moving a SIM from one phone to the other anyway. What's happening is they're giving your phone number from one carrier to another carrier, almost like changing uh, ownership on a domain name. Uh, and 
there's no, there are no stores. There's no idiot in a minimum wage guy's mobile store. You have to be able to. You have to hack my Google account to move my number, and it's hard to hack the Google. Account. Uh, not necessarily. It really depends on how it's structured because ultimately uh, number reporting requests have to be honored by law and if it, it, they're um, placed and set up in the right way from the right uh, entry points, they're going to be honored. Um, so uh, I would say that uh, of the carriers that I've looked at, you know, Phi is not as susceptible, but there's still a lot of evidence that Phi numbers are being ported just like everything else because they all kind of share the same rules. I'm sorry, I was just going to answer that. Uh, there, there, there are other ways also. Um, first of all, how many people here have AT&T as a carrier? Get off of it in the morning, in my opinion. <laughs> because they're the only ones that don't let you uh, have a lockdown. The other ones let you actually go and lock it down. So at least that means that if somebody comes in, they're like, oh, sorry, um, you have to hand me your old SIM and we'll give you the new SIM. Otherwise, you've got to go to the fraud department. at and is the only one that basically makes it really easy for these people to get bribed. Um, T-Mobile um, is, is better in that, A, they will, you can request SIM lockdown. And the other thing also, they have a um, pretty tricked program, which is called Digits. It's $10 a month. It's SIMless, and it lets you take your old phone that basically has your number that everybody thinks they're going to hack and make it virtual and forward it to your new phone number on T-Mobile and your new phone number, you never put data on it. And by getting a new number, you can remember if you ever put data on it. Starting today, I never put data on it. And that, that seems to be pretty foolproof. Say that one more time. How does it work? So, and again, I'm not aware of anybody else who has the program, but um, T-Mobile, um, is what I recommend to people if they want to stay with a carrier. The other thing is pretty, uh, uh, pretty foolproof is Cricket. <laughs> you just simply have a, a, a plan that's a, it's a burner phone. Basically, you have to go and just go into a place and pay by cash whenever you, whenever you want to re-up your minutes. I mean, I know a number of people who had Cricket phones for their, uh, who were like old-time Bitcoiners who had Cricket forever just because they were digital nomads. They, you know couldn't get a phone because they were like, you know, kind of didn't have the same address or any time or they didn't have a lot of reportable income or whatever. The second all of a sudden they got a good job and they went and got uh, AT&T, boom, they got hacked. And um, so uh, Cricket is really good. It's just a little inconvenient for people to go and say, you have to go and, you know, oh, I'm out of minutes, I gotta go and buy a new card. But Digits, D-I-G-I-T-S, um, is a T-Mobile product. It's an app. Um, and what you do is you have to go and get a new T-Mobile account, um, and you know you get it with a number that basically is just your friends and family number. You never, ever, ever use it for, for T to a fay. You then put it on SIM lockdown, and then you sign up for the digits using a address that you're not particularly you know known for, and ideally a, a name and a phone number. Maybe it's not associated with you if you really want to be completely tin tinfoil about it. And, um, and then you forward the number that people would be trying to hack, the one that's associated with you and that you know they've tried to hack before, or they did hack before, and that then forwards into your phone, and it's seamless. In fact, you can actually reply from that number, both by text and by, uh, I use it, it's a good product. It's a virtual number. It's a virtual number, 10 bucks a month, can't, can't be SIM swapped because there is no SIM, can't be ported, because you've already ported it, and you ported it and okay. you're into, a, into something that basically has a, a SIM lock and it's a non-SIM number. As a, as a very simple option, uh, fronting yourself with a, a Google Voice number also seems to help a little bit, just because, uh, again, there's no SIM, you have to port it somewhere else, which is harder. There are certain things that Google Voice will not let you um, use as authentication, um, and Rob, were you the one telling me that there were some exploits on uh, Google Voice or somebody else? I did, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, Rob Ross, by the way, is uh, head of uh, stops, StopSimCrime.org. <coughs> yes, um, <clears throat> Michael and I have uh, a lot in common. Uh, well, we have one thing in common, which is uh, our hacker. <laughs> so I, I was sim swapped as well. Um, yeah, the Google exploit is, you, uh, so Gmail is susceptible to a phishing attack. So if someone takes over your Gmail, I mean, happens, um, they can then take over your... Yeah. Obviously, any Gmail, particularly the one that you have uh, any crypto information or any, um, uh, I just have, just blanket, 
all your Gmail, even if it, even if you think that you've never told anybody about it, there are hacker tools that are reverse look up of your number, and you have to put Google 2 fa in every yeah. single Gmail account and remove remove hints, remove everything, everything except Google 2 fa yeah, I completely agree with that. And uh, I mean, putting strong 2 fa ideally security key, right, or at least some something similar um, on your Google account, on your wife's Google account, my kids. You know, use security keys is one of the strongest things you can do because that basically. Um, now we're getting a little into what can we do about it, right? If yeah, it's yeah, okay yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I fundamentally think that that ultimately um, this is a battle we can't win, right? I mean, the, the, neither AT and T nor, nor, nor T Mobile nor any of these guys is really set up to provide the necessary level of security, the necessary level of security of the most security sensitive user of your website. Right? They, they, that's not what they're set up for, right? I mean, they, they cater to the masses, they want a fairly seamless process. Uh, you know, so if you're suddenly trying to secure large amounts of Bitcoin, uh, and this is the weakest link, that I don't think this can possibly work. And, and, and in my opinion, they, cr they created the problem themselves by act actively going to software companies and saying, hey, you want more security? Use the SMS as backup. And, and when, it, when it was, mo you, I mean, I would have been much more secure without an SMS backup. That, that was a really stupid idea, no? Yeah. I mean, the, so, so basically I think we have to move away from that. Today, if a website uses SMS or phone calls for two-factor authentication, the only this website is doing something wrong, right? And it's actually interesting, the, the, the European regulator just reacted and is now specifically disallowing SMS or phone-based two-factor for certain types of transactions, you know, which is a, which is a very interesting new trend. So I'll get to you in a second. Um, so, you know, the, and, and if you look at, for example, at Google, right, uh, Google about nine months, no, six months ago, I want to say, um, they allow you to turn off SMS and phone-based account recovery. So you can go in there and say, the only thing I want to allow is, uh, you know, two-factor uh, using a hardware dongle, for example, like a hardware key, right, which is incredibly secure. If you look at the Google research actually published some really good data where they're comparing different ways of authentication. Um, and then how they uh, how they do in uh, against different types of attacks. So they basically they they took lots of attacks. You know they do wholesale phishing. They just you know, blanket. And even the more targeted phishing that maybe you know has the right company header or so. And then there's the spear phishing. It's this email from your boss on a Friday, referencing transaction you know about. I immediately need you to do X Y Z. Right. So and and if you look at them, um, still across 360,000 accounts, they had zero compromises if they used uh, like like hardware based two factor authentication. So, so that's kind of where we're, now we're on to where are we going, and uh, that's a pretty good example. Uh, Lance, you want to chime in with, uh, what is it, is it getting better or worse? I mean, uh, I guess that's one question. I, you know, I, uh, on the way over here, read a BBC article about uh, North Korea getting, uh, making $1.6 billion on stolen cryptocurrency, uh, and, and that being one of the major, uh, sources of income for their recent, uh, I mean, so how, is it getting better or worse, can you really protect against uh, an organized s state actor? Uh, I, I think that you absolutely can, but uh, not with the tactics and uh, methods that we're using today. Uh, we, the, the, the capabilities are here and the tactics that we're using to protect ourselves are way on here. Um, uh, and, and even when we think about approaching like a symptomatic thing, like, okay, how do I protect my number from being ported? And this, this is a good question to ask. But we also have to ask, once we stop that problem, what's, what's the, the next attack if we're still using SMS? Um, you can actually buy $20 devices on Amazon right now called RTL SDRs. You can plug it in, and the United States is required that you can downgrade um, uh, text message communications down to 2G. Uh, that means that you effectively can force someone's text messages to be sent in plain text. Uh, now, it is technically encrypted, but the tools to decrypt it are less than $100. So um, that just means that, okay, we made that attack a little bit harder. Now we're going to move on to the next easiest attack. We need to be a few steps ahead here. Um, and I mean, we have a lot more thoughts on, on, on solutions, but uh, uh, I, I don't think it's going to get better until we're willing to change our habits and the, the need to say, I'm used to using SMS and I have to have SMS be reliable. Uh, we have to start pushing back on, on that completely the other methods. Yeah, and today is about talking about 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 SMS, which again is you know over a billion, probably two or three billion. But you know that 1.6 billion for Korea number um, includes just other types of hacks that are not SMS enabled. 
um, you know, Mailchimp hacks and the parody hacks, and there's all there's a number of different exploits. But um, the the low hanging fruit for these these you know organized crime gangs uh, like the OG users, which are you know teenagers and young adults, they're I call them valedictorians gone bad. I mean, you know, they're basically the mafia except of crypto, and they met each other playing video games, and then kind of graduated from playing GTA to doing real grand theft. And um, you know, uh, I, I think that you know they will continue to go and work on any exploit they can until they're put in jail. Which obviously that's a big thing too. But as long as it's this easy to go and hack, you put it, you put a hundred of them in jail, and a thousand more will pop up because it's easy money until you get caught. One of, one of the things also that I think is contributing to the challenge. I mean, certainly you mentioned before the um, kind of convenience factor of being able to port the numbers, but in my attack, uh, one thing that I noticed, uh, so first of all, I used a, a, a authenticator called Authy. Does anybody use here, use or have Authy? One? Okay. Uh, it's like Google Authenticator, but it's just a different name. Uh, Authy actually uses SMS for its recovery or for installing a new phone. And I had a, you know, in Authy, there's a little toggle switch that says allow multi device. And because I had that toggle switch, the million dollar toggle switch for me. <laughs> um, and when I was talking with uh, Coinbase fraud uh, and Gemini fraud, uh, the fraud departments, they have actually spoken with Authy about not having the, uh, 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 this off by default, or, or rather not having it turn off uh, by default, because uh, it would provide too much friction for the customer. So I think one of the things that's happening is this whole battle between ease of use and you know friction with security because how many people is it really impacting? It's impacting, it's starting to impact you know, a lot more people, but um, one of the big problems I see is that it's not like you have you know, the, the Coinbase, Gemini, AT&T, Verizon consortium to combat SIM swapping. Um, they're just kind of all doing their own thing and they're passing it off to each other. And so, you know, it's kind of a problem that nobody's really saying that they want to own. Yeah. So, so what's, uh, if, if, if it's not really getting better because the actors, the bad actors are, have more and more exploits, what, what's the path, what's a good path from here? I mean, do we all have to get so uh, sophisticated, even more sophisticated than the people in this room uh, individually? Is that the only way we're gonna be able to knock this down a little bit? So, so my impression is right now, actually, we're, we're not actually trying. <laughs> I mean, the, so, so as a website, if you still have SMS-based account recovery or what Authy is doing there, I'm sorry. You know, this is, I mean, today, today it's no longer um, best of breed. Uh, like when, when I'm trying to anticipate where are we going all as an industry, I usually um, look at the, the big tech companies first because they typically have the highest pain points and, and so you know, often are the best in, in innovating, right? If you look at what the, you know, pick any, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, what these guys are doing, they all have deployed hardware tokens at scale at this point, right? So, so you know the little. Not sure if everybody's seen these little USB tokens like this. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Perfect. So you can basically it, it, these things cost you know twenty bucks or so, including shipping. Um, basically, you, they generate a key on them, and they're basically unclonable, right? Which is kind of a nice property, right? They're, they're temper resistant. So basically, you plug them to your computer, you touch a contact, and they can authenticate you to a site. Um, if you lose them, it's gone, right? But at least nobody can copy this thing, and certainly nobody can copy this thing remotely, right? That's a, it's a very simple but a very powerful property because that means if this is the only authenticator that you've enrolled, uh, then somebody remotely taking over your account is not possible, right? And typically, you probably want to enroll two or three in case you lose one, right? Otherwise, it's a very uh, the very so if you, if you look at if you start a large tech company today, there's a good chance that in day one they'll give you one of those or two of those, right? Two, so you never call the call center. <laughs> just if, uh, if you lose one, you can just grab a new one from the fishbowl. Um, the, the price points of these things are, are getting low enough that I think in the future um, many people will use them. Right? The, the other part of the equation is actually um, we're starting to see some new standards, so you may not even need a hardware dongle anymore. There's a, you know, if you look at the, the latest authentication standards, there's WebAuthN and FIDO2. Right? Before there was US, uh, uh, U2F and, and FIDO. So these are standards that basically 
that allow you to enroll a similar chip as it is in these little hardware tokens that's inside your phone for authentication. So basically, you can go to a site, you can say, I want to register this phone as a trusted device. Uh, they say, okay, you know, apply your fingerprint, generate a little key in a, in a secure enclave, and um, then basically use that key in the future to authenticate that phone. And again, it's basically now impossible to clone that authenticator from that phone, or almost impossible. And uh, you know, it's definitely very, very difficult to do that remotely. So now you have, if you have created a trusted device, it can make a huge step forward. So which of these, however, stop bribery? In other words, if you've got this on your machine and somebody goes in and AT&T won't uh, you know, let you have a SIM lockdown and they say you're you and the person who's been bribed does it and he turns off your device, do any of these dongles stop the device from being turned off and switched over to a new phone? So if you can bribe AT&T and basically saying, ignore that device, take another device as yours, obviously no, right? Yeah. That's what happens in the majority of the cases. That said, um, I currently, for every single site where it's possible to turn off SMS or phone-based right. uh, reset, I've turned it off, right? And you should. It should not be active anywhere. This is just, um, I think, today, bad hygiene, if, if you're still using that. Um, <clears throat> If you use that, then yes, your phone got compromised. It's really annoying. You have to run after AT&T or T-Mobile or pick your favorite carrier, right, to get this thing back. But at the same time, your, you know, whatever, Binance or, or Coinbase accounts are still safe because there you'll register with a security token and then having your phone number actually doesn't help them at all, right? Your Gmail account is still safe. All the other accounts that you have are now unaffected from, from uh, somebody having compromised your phone. And that's because you've generated some kind of token on the phone but it's not associated with the SIM. Exactly. Right. Yeah, and Google 2FA does largely the same thing. And the one thing also for those of you using Google 2FA, don't put it on the same phone that you use for every day. Um, because if you lose that phone, then you're screwed. Put it on like a, I mean, the best practice is, you know, get an Android tablet and just put it in a safe. And uh, one without a phone on it, just like a, a, a Wi-Fi tablet, put it in a safe and make sure every time you do it, you put down the recovery key because if, you, if that device dies, you have to go in and use that recovery key to put it on a new device. If you lose that, then you have to actually go to the service and prove your you. So can I get, with Google to obey, you mean the Google Authenticator? Google Authenticator, yes. yes. I want to get on one more soapbox here and say, I, I don't think that's the right solution either. And there's, the Google Authenticator has many really good properties, right? I mean, it's, uh, it's not guessable, it gets stored in secure enclave, that's all good. It still has one problem, which is that it's fishable, right? Sorry. It's fishable. Right? So basically, I set up a fake google.com, right? I get you to go to fake google.com, type in your, your number, I immediately use that with real google.com, and I'm in your account. Does that make sense? Well, typically it's not fake Google, it's fake Binance or fake wherever you end up putting it <laughs> Exactly, but, but basically, I can, I can capture what you type in, I can send it to the real site, and I can now log into the real site. And this may seem, you may wonder like, okay, how easy is this, right? Building a system that in real time captures this and then logs into another site. Turns out there's great software packages today, you know, a couple of Docker containers, uh, you know, with a, with a Kubernetes file, that basically has both the fake website plus a headless Chrome instance that does the login afterwards, right? So and, all and, fully automated. And, and aren't, you those, download the internet. Aren't, aren't those typically caught by just a hygiene, like looking to make sure that it's got its certificates and running proper malware? Doesn't help, right? I mean, if, if I can trick you going to the wrong site and typing in that code, I'm in your account. So right, but that you didn't answer my question. Oh. I mean, if you know how to how to see a fake account, like you when you go in, you actually bookmark the real account. You make sure that it has an accurate certificate. All that helps. It can be really difficult, right? I mean, you know, things are spelled similarly. Honestly, some of these sites use brain dead names sometimes. You know, I, I worked in a large company that, that shall remain unnamed, where, you know, suddenly for login, I was uh, to redirect to something like PPP-2. So I called, you know, so now, 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 now that's legitimate. Now we're talking about spoofing, which is a huge problem as well. I mean, for example, um, if you're on Telegram, I mean, I, I'm, I've got, well, actually, <laughs> Reese sent me someone who, try, who, who basically created a fake Michael Turpin account and tried to sell him mining investments. And Chris, you know, we've known each other for a number of years. And just the way that the guy talked, you kind of knew that it wasn't me. It's like, I think it said, do you like my content? <laughs> yes. Would you like to hear of an investment? 
sure. <laughs> and then it's like, make 30% per day or whatever. And he's just like, pay me. It's like, I think you're being spoofed. And the best one I ever saw, by the way, if you have a name uh, that has, I mean, first of all, in every social network you can get sort of, uh, you know, kind of authenticated ones, get them uh, verified accounts. But uh, the best one I saw, because I've had several people on Telegram, you know, pretend to be me and be at Michael Turpin 1 1 or whatever. I'm just at Michael Turpin on every social media. Um, and somebody actually got, and someone said, hey, you know, uh, somebody was just trying to get Bitcoin from me, they've taken over your Telegram account. I said, no, no, there's a spoof. He goes, no, look at it, it's at Michael Turpin. He's like, it was at Mike L with a number one instead of an L. Ooh, really good. So if you have an L in your name, make sure you get that one, don't use it for anything. Uh, one thing I would add to this is, um, so I have done a lot of uh, phishing and, and, um, and security research and also for, for important companies and whatnot, and uh, uh, I found that I can consistently fish even security researchers, CTOs, etc., who are good at this stuff. Because you catch them early in the morning and you catch them with just the right hook, something financial. Hey, did you expect this transaction? Click here to find out, right? You tailor to them just right, you get an emotional hook and they will fly right past it. And then it's just, oh look, a password prompt and a prompt to put in your Google 2FA. And you'll just do it. If, it's, if you think it's important, you think it's urgent. Um, and so uh, we can't even really trust ourselves fully to do it right 100% of the time. So we have to have a tool that'll let us do that. Um, one other addition to Google Authenticator, I've actually audited the code for both um, iOS and Android. Um, and, and both of these, it actually just stores an SQLite text file. Um, it does not use a secure enclave because it's secure enclave on most phones. Uh, does not actually support the TOTP algorithm required. So, uh, in short, um, if your phone has any exploits on it at all that allow other apps to read the files of other apps, which is very common in both iOS and Android, um, they can take your 2FA to token master seed and use it all day long to generate codes. Uh, so this, this is also a dead-end method, and Google, who helped promote this, is also seeing this as a dead-end method in promoting hardware tokens now. Another reason to put it on a different device. <laughs> yeah. So, so one last thing on the, the point of phishing here, right? I think any good authentication mechanism in the future needs to be phishing proof, right? And because, again, I, I think you're completely right, right? You can probably trick me <laughs> if you try hard enough. Uh, Google Research actually had some really interesting data on, uh, you know, I think the, they got, they, the, of, of all the accounts that they were attacked with highly um, specialized phishing attacks, they said about 20% or so, um, you know, were compromised uh, if they used something like Google Authenticator. Right, so 80% protection is not bad, but, but still 20% uh, breach is pretty bad, right? So there, there are modern protocols today, like, like WebAuthn, that actually are effectively phishing proof. And let, let me explain how this works, because it's actually pretty clever. So basically, um, if you use like a, a security key, um, or you, know, a, a, you can actually do it with the biometrics um, and, a, and the, the secure element as well um, on, on devices. But if you, if you communicate with a web server, um, so basically the first time you enroll, for example, on my security key, will generate a private key that only I know. Right? And I can use this, for example, to sign things. Uh, and this happens automatically. Right? The user doesn't see anything. You just like pl plug this thing in, new website, enroll, okay. Right? Now, if I go to that website again to authenticate, the website will basically, my, my browser will take the domain name of that website, and then we create basically a digital signature over a challenge plus the domain name of that website. A little technical here, but, but bear with me. Right? So think about how this works with the phishing site. You know, he is uh, redirecting me to uh, fakebinance.com or something like that, you know, where I'm to, to type in my, and, and I'm using my authenticator. It now takes from the web browser, fakebinance.com, plus the challenge, signs that, and sends it back. So he now has a valid authenticator for fakebinance.com. The problem is he can't use that for real Binance, right? Because the domain name is stuck in there. If he presents it to real Binance, real Binance is like fakebinance.com. That's certainly not an authenticator I would accept, right? So by basically having support in the browser to take the domain name as part of the security handshake, this redirecting to another site doesn't work anymore. And that's a huge step forward, right, by basically taking that out of the equation. It was mentioned a little bit earlier about key logging. So we're talking about taking a, 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 an iPad, putting it inside a locker in a safe deposit box, but then we take that code and we plug it in and sure enough, we get key log. So how do you address that? Uh, so I actually, um, uh, at uh, some of the firms I work with, uh, we have used key loggers in the wild many times, and uh, I've had people use them on me, and ultimately it comes down to uh, designing it to where if you had a key logger, it wouldn't matter. 
Um, and uh, in my case, since in order to access servers or sensitive things or whatnot, because I'm using a hardware token, um, before I can actually access any of these uh, sensitive services, this token is going to physically start blinking, and I need to be there to physically touch it. So you can keylog me all day long, and you'll see me ranting about various things on the internet, but you won't actually get the uh, token required to uh, do this sort of handshake in order to be able to do an authorization. Um, this is very powerful. It means as long as I have this physical thing with me, I can be confident that nobody's going to uh, take my accounts away. Uh, some pretty good. There's some pretty good um, um, anti-keylogging software. Uh, Zamana, for example, is very good, and you know I think you can you know put it on like three or four computers for like you know, 100 bucks a year or something, and uh, it catches stuff. I mean, it's more in a mall where they catch us because I don't think I've actually ever been knowingly keylogged, but it does say you're safe for being keylogged every day when you put it up. Uh, th there is some software that, uh, that that does make some of some of these claims, and uh, I I'm, I don't know the ones specifically they're talking about, um, but the keyloggers, a lot of the ones that are being deployed right now, especially when there's high value targets. Uh, one of them was deployed on the uh, Apple. Uh, wireless keyboard. You could just do a drive-by attack, do a pair with it, install software, uh, up special firmware on the keyboard itself that will make the keyboard itself key you. Uh, and then later you can come out and pick up those keystrokes. This is not going to be detectable by software on the computer because software is not running on the computer. Uh, likewise, uh, you could bribe someone in the cleaning crew uh, to say, hey, plug in this special USB cable. Um, I've actually got some in my bag. Uh, this, they look like real USB cables. They're undetectable. It's yes. Unbelievable. Yes, I actually have some. Uh, every time somebody feels like something uh, is wrong or they to work with, they'll, they'll, they'll bring those cables. This is one of, the, one of your special cables uh, because they look absolutely identical. You, you cannot tell them apart from regular cables. You swap out the whole keyboard or cable. Uh, there are digital methods that are very hard to detect as well, but uh, physical methods are even harder. So once again, I think we just have to anticipate um, just assume that everything is being keylogged and say, if that's true, am I still protected? And if the answer is no, then you might want to reach one of these other methods. So, so we've, we've talked about uh, phishing and keylogging, and, and what are the other couple of, uh, just to summarize before we run out of our 45 minutes, phishing, keylogging, and what are the other uh, attack vectors that, uh, that you want to protect against? And I'm, I think, if I've understood correctly, that the hardware token, the YubiKey or whatever uh, hardware token you want to use, would protect against all of those other attack vectors. Is that, am I getting the right idea? I, I would say that protecting against most classes of attack, uh, at least most of the popular classes of attack, is dramatically better than any other option that users can easily reach for today. Um, I'm a big fan of uh, YubiKeys, also use uh, uh, Thank you. Uh, 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 treasures and ledgers for other specific use cases where you need a screen on the device. Um, but there's a lot of great devices in the market to help uh, with, uh, with this sort of thing. And the number one, I, I've helped deploy these in a few organizations, and uh, always the big fear is, but well, that's complicated, that sounds hard, that sounds difficult to use. But we already carry around these secure enclave things on our, our, our credit cards all the time. And uh, they have a actual secure enclave device on it. I won't say it's a very good one, but it is one. Uh, and you put in a pen number and you use it. Uh, so something you have plus a pen number or, or a touch or something like this. Um, we're already used to this. So if we just translate that same uh, thing to our online activities, we're going to have dramatically better security. I think one other thing we're slowly starting to tackle is how we deal with mobile applications, right? Because they run into many of the same problems. So um, this thing is actually not available yet, but we've announced it. So this is a, a lightning. YubiKey, key, right? So you can actually use the same, uh, you know, one side USB-C, use that for your MacBook, right? And the other one you have Lightning to use with your phone. So you can use the same hardware token for, for both your mobile transactions and your, and your computer transactions. Yeah, and, and on, on that note, uh, uh, I'll shamelessly you plug your product since it's not as perfect. Thank you. Yourself. A, sorry about that. Um, yeah, uh, so another product they offer, in addition to Google Authenticator, as I was just saying, it stores it in plain text, so a product called Yubico Authenticator. So for those services that's, that don't support hardware tokens directly and say we only support Google Authenticator, it's a drop in replacement. You install the app. And so to get my codes, I just tap my key to the back of the phone, and my, key, my phone is just acting as effectively a screen um, for uh, uh, those codes. Uh, and so, once again, this means that the secret isn't living on my phone, and so if others on the mall were on the phone, it can't actually take that secret and generate codes free for all. Um, this is still not anywhere near as great as something like WebOptIn, um, but as a stopgap, it's, it's, it's great. Right. Yeah. So, is that what you would recommend, your, your bank, right? Is that what you would recommend you say, all users in order to use mobile banking now have to have one of these physical hardware keys, and if you would, 
conjecture if you think that that makes sense from like the consumer's perspective? Uh, I, I know for organizations that I've advised, I've uh, you know told them, and, and in some cases they've actually done it and said, uh, these customers that aren't willing to move to one of these secure methods, are they worth the risk? Are they worth the progress that they represent? And uh, most customers, they say, hey, here's an al another alternative to use, they'll use it. Because ultimately, if somebody has a lot of money or with a bank or whatever, they want to store these things securely, they're going to one of these organizations because they don't trust it being under their mattress. They're saying, hey, can you protect this? Tell me how to do it. They're looking to that company to tell them what to do. And if that company says, oh, just use SMS, it's fine, they're going to do it. If they say, here's a Yubi key, I'm going to mail you one, they're more likely to do that. Um, so we also have to put pressure on these companies, as those of us who are a little bit better educated, to help out those who aren't. I guess that, that was another part of where are we going. It, 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 there's things that we can individually do, but it, you know, to protect ourselves. Uh, but the guy who was at StopSimCrime.org has left. Are there are there group things that we can do to uh, to make the carriers change their ways, or to get banks to use um, something other than SMS as a reset? Okay. I think I think that's slowly happening, right? I mean, if, if you're, just to, to continue on the bank for a second, right? If you're a bank, typically how you think about this is uh, what's the fraud risk and, and you know, it's, it's more or less a financial uh, argument, right? Is, is it more expensive to get my users a, a security key and then support the security key or is it more expensive just to eat the losses, right? Very often it comes, comes down to that. I would just add and also the loss of adoption, right? You also run the risk that you offer a solution like this and your users say, no thanks, I'll go to Wells Fargo instead. Very true, yeah. And the, so the, what, what we're seeing is that at this point, um, for low-end retail banking, I, I see very few banks jumping into that yet. Right? Let's talk again in three years, but, but that's, that's where we're today. At the high-end, uh, like, like the um, you know, um, uh, high net worth individuals, right? they were actually seeing relatively broad adoption of, of top banks, that so they're starting to handing out these devices, say, look, if you want to do business with us, right, you need to use a hardware token. Right, and then we'll, we'll send a trainer if necessary. <laughs> you know, um, just because it's from a fraudless perspective, it's, it's worth it. If you look at the, I mean, today, um, it, it, funnily enough, it's no longer banks that have the most valuable assets that they're protecting. Right? Often, a large SaaS company has far more valuable assets in the data than a bank has in the money. Does that make sense? Uh, and if you look at the, the large SaaS companies, they are almost all using some form of security token uh, at this point. <clears throat> this actually happened to me twice, at and blah, blah, blah. After my second one, I got a call from uh, a New York City detective who's on a task force, and we had two calls where he interviewed me to explain what happened and wh what are my ideas. I had no ideas, of course, but you know, maybe you guys should uh, help them out. Is there something going on with law enforcement to protect us? Yeah, so Homeland Security started something called the REACT Task Force. Um, the main office is actually in Northern California out of the uh, Santa Clara County Sheriff's Office. I wish it existed when I had my $24 million hack in uh, uh, January of 2018, which by the way was that large because I got hacked on the day of the altcoin moon. So that was the day that everything reached 800 million and I got hacked for three altcoins that are coins that I had uh, in two or three cases, I had uh, done advisory and PR services for, so I had a whole bunch of those coins, which in the beginning were worth less than a penny, and at the altcoin moon, one of them had gone up to being worth $8, and the other one went up to being worth $48. And uh, today, I think uh, the one that went up to 48 is worth about a buck, and the one that uh, uh, was went up to about uh, you know seven or eight dollars is worth under ten cents. But that was um, something that we were able to hack, turn into Bitcoin. There was enough demand for them to go and launder the entire $24 million through um, multiple um, accounts, um, primarily on Binance, uh, that were opened up one day earlier and they got KYC, uh, full KYC for 100 Bitcoin a day in one day. And you know, it's a non-US account, even though they serve US customers. And so I'm still trying to get more information from them. They said, well, we shared it with the Secret Service and the FBI. We don't have to share it for you, even though you have, uh, even though you have warrants. I uh, sorry, even though you have a judgment, and even though you have, um, uh, they're like, yeah, we don't respond to civil litigation. We just only respond to, uh, to, the, to the government for criminal investigation. And 
So still continuing that battle. Um, but uh, you know, there are things that if you want to be a good player in the industry, you should be cooperating with with us because they only even knew that those the five accounts were there is because I called them <laughs> and said, here are the five things that apparently took took uh, accounts from me. And there were only, for the larger asset, only two exchanges that had it. And I knew one of them personally. They were a US-based exchange. And I actually represented them for a while. And I Skyped uh, the CEO. And he said, oh, geez, let me look. Nope, not ours. So that meant it was Binance. And then I had to go through people to get to the head of customer service. And they're like, yep, that's ours. We froze them. Most of the money was gone by then, and they have all the records of where it is, and the FBI has been sitting on it for about 18 months, because they move very slowly. Um, if you have anything, you want to go to ic3.org, that's the Internet Crime uh, Authority, and all these agents look and kind of like say, oh, I'm going to take it. But if you're in Northern California and it happens, um, the REACT Task Force out of Santa Clara County Sheriff's Department, Caleb Tuttle's the main guy, he's a badass. I mean. He He's, actually traced this to a uh, retail shop on West 48th Street in Manhattan. Right, so that's that's only part of it, right? That's the tip of the iceberg. That is the guy who got bribed. You then want to know, because you're able to go in, the information is there, and that's what React Task Force and the FBI and everybody can find out. Um, the difference between React and the FBI um, is that the FBI, they like to go and round up everybody and then do the... Turn on the TV cameras. We just arrested a gang of 12 people, and if it takes them two or three years, that's what the, that's what it takes. Whereas with React, because they're a local group with Homeland Security um, backing, they're able to actually go to a local judge and say, "Hey, I have some information that we need a search warrant," and a local judge will give it to them. That's how they were able to bust Nicholas Truglia, who robbed a million dollars from him and was part of the gang. It's alleged, but on his phone, he actually confesses to it, to his dad. Hey, I'm rich now, the day of my hack. And also to his best friend, we're going to go and uh, hire porn stars and go to the Super Bowl. Um, that's actually, if you look at Krebs on security, uh, he's got all the screenshots of that. That's part of the evidence. Um, but um, they were able to go in and immediately, they moved very quickly, get a search warrant. And they went to New York City, which is where this guy was, because... In his case, they had six different cases that all were AT&T stores all over the place, yeah. and they all said somebody walked into the store, and the towers tell the truth. The towers said, SIM got turned off here, should show up being lit up in the store at another phone. All of a sudden, it got lit up in the same block in New York City on 42nd Street yeah. where this guy is. And, you know... Once, maybe twice, a coincidence, six, seven, eight, ten times, it's the guy, right? And so that's why he's sitting in Santa Clara um, uh, jail right now, and he's got his uh, bail hearing uh, next week, and we certainly think he's a flight risk, and we'll let people know that. So um, can law enforcement actually do something here? Oh, they arrested this guy. I mean, in general, in the general solution. Is there a well, I mean, obviously, if more people acted like, well, first of all, if it happens to you, your best bet is, first of all, act quickly, right? So you want to, first of all, make sure that you call the telephone company and keep calling, calling, calling until somebody turns it off. Because as long as it's not turned off and returned to you, they can still keep on just fishing around. They can go and get your domain names changed. They can go and you may not remember what 15 years ago you put a phone number on. And they, they know that. They can figure that out. So if you get it turned off, and in my case... They actually, we got it turned off within five minutes, and it got turned back on again. So the guy, they bribed twice. And my wife is, you know, smart enough to say, wait, it's supposed to be off, because we kept calling to make sure it was really off, and all of a sudden it turned on again. And How did you know it got turned on again? Because she called the number, and it said, it's just like rang, and it was going through. Yeah, He's got right. Your wife. Is that your wife now? Yeah. <laughs> But um, no, and in that second period um, is when they took all the, uh, was when they were able to go and crack something. So in other words, they wanted more time. They said, oh, I think we're getting close here. Yeah. Turn the thing back on. So that's where the ultimate solution in terms of this type of SIM swap is don't let retail clerks get bribed. But if that happens to you, first and foremost, get it turned off. Get it returned to your phone. Not just turned off, because I just had it frozen. Return, I didn't have it. What do you mean return? Return to your number, right? Yeah, yeah. So I just had it frozen. I didn't have it returned to my number because that's 
sometimes takes extra action from them, like calling the fraud department and everything. This is a Sunday, most of yeah. them happen on Sundays, um, or late at night if they're going first, through a call center. The first time I went through the calling and all the in insanity, the second time, I, I'm, I, like you said, I'm talking and there's no, my phone's yeah. dead, and I know I have signal. So you go on another call, no, phone call, and you make sure that you I get it frozen, and then, yeah, well, frozen, and then, and then, and then the other thing also to do within as fast as you can when the when the store is open, yeah. go in that's and say I want to look at the logs. That's what they did. Because Five then you can later. see where it is, yep. and then you ask also. You, I got a picture of the logs. They weren't happy about it, but I snapped the picture. Oh. The guy actually at AT and T the first time said, right. "That's AT and T property." I said, "Call that's police." Cool. You showed it to me in a public place. That's the second time, I didn't even take that chance. I just had my wife ask, and I'm in the back going, click, 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 click. And true. because then if you actually see the full log, you can see the actual um, IMEI, yeah. um, and you can, you can track it. And you give that to the authorities, and they can just show where it got lit up. And then they will go to a local, if you're using Santa Clara, and you're all here in California, um, Northern California, they'll go get a warrant, and they'll bust the guy the next day. They've been very good at busting people. The FBI is not. Uh, well, one quick thing I would add is um, I've been party to a few of these cases. Um, people have it happen to them. I, I you know, end up trying to help walk them through what to do. Uh, that also means every time somebody's phone service drops, they call me and say, I, I don't know what I'm trying to do, right? Uh, yeah, but, uh, uh, but in, a, in a few cases like this, um, oftentimes it's somebody remote controlling something in the US. And if the person that is actually doing this or the group that's doing this is outside of the US or in a country that doesn't extradite, uh, I, I've, I've talked to Secret Service. They'll often just say, sorry, in this situation, we have a lot of these. We're aware of it, keeping an eye on it. But there's not much we can do about this yeah. case. Um, so the thing that you, you can do is just move away from SMS services. I know for me, it's a really great feeling to know that if my number gets ported right now, the damage that you can do to me is very small. And it took a lot of work to set that up. Um, but uh, the personal security that it gives me is worth it. Well, Pimo gave me the, uh, the hook. So uh, we'll we'll break now, and you guys can uh, ask questions as long as as long as these folks will uh, stick around. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you.